Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. We're talking about Community Matters today. I'm Jay Fidel. this is Think Tech, and we care about the community, we care about Community Matters, and we care about preserving the community so it doesn't you know, go toast one day over uh, the kind of threat we were worried about a month ago, um, and which you know, logically could still happen um, based on diplomatic failure and based on somebody pulling the trigger or getting scared. And uh, so we want to talk about exactly how exposed Hawaii is. Uh, with Sidney Higa, he's retired uh, U.S. Air Force major. He was involved in communications and computer development there. Uh, and with uh, uh, Bert Lord, who is a retired um, nuclear engineer, uh, was chief uh, machinist in the uh, U.S. Navy and submarines. Um, and uh, wow, what a combination of guys we have here today. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thank you for Thank having you us much. on the show. Appreciate it. So let's talk about nuclear bombs. You know, the one that blew up in uh, Hiroshima was like 15 kilotons. We got bombs that are much bigger now, yeah? Much, much bigger. How big? Uh, I think the largest uh, Russian uh, nuclear warhead that has been exploded is 100 megatons. 100 megatons? Huge, very large. That's a lot bigger than 15 kilotons. It's like hundreds of times bigger. Absolutely. Thousands. Yeah. So we saw, you know, we've all seen the photographs we've read over the last about 70 years, um, what, what the, um, I forget the name of the bomb. There was a name on the bomb. Came off the Enola Gay, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, blew up Hiroshima. We, we saw what that did to Hiroshima and to the people in Hiroshima. Pretty powerful stuff and nasty business. But, uh, you know, uh, eight, you say 800? 500 megatons. Five, 500, 500, 500 megatons. 500 megatons. Um, that would do, that would be different. Um, that, right. would, that would waste any city. It would waste uh, everything for miles around. <laughs> Can you talk about Tens it? Tens of miles around, yes. Tens of miles around. Yeah. yeah. Definitely, yeah. So um, we have, uh, um, Bert, why don't you go ahead and... Uh, okay. Yeah, Bert, into the, so you've done yeah. a little research on this, and you found uh, some figuring by a guy who works at the Department of Energy, yeah? Stevens is his name, about so, exactly what kind of effect a bomb would have in Oahu. Can you talk about it? There's a, there's a guy named uh, Alex Wellerstein who has put together... Wellerstein. Well, yeah, well, Wellerstein, who has put together a, um, a site called NukeMap. And what he has used, he worked for the Department of Energy, and he also worked for several different institutes of technology, and, and uh, he's a researcher in this area. And he has put together a website where you can actually go to and put in uh, what type of a strike it is, ground strike versus aerial strike, size of the weapon, things like that, which actually gives you a radius. Uh, it's a radius map for the actual initial blast radius, which is uh, devastation. And then your second blast radius, which is uh, more of an irradiation, kind of like being nuked in a microwave. Not as much uh, physical destruction, but definitely cellular destruction. Body cells. Body cells, yeah, melting. You fry. And fry, mm -hmm. yeah, you're cooking right. from inside. Yeah. And then your third uh, ring is really a contamination ring. It's where everything is going to have some sort of contamination around it. And those rings are really the initial blast rings. Uh, from there, there's follow-on you know, catastrophe and follow-on problems that you're going to have with uh, the migratory effect of any types of animals in those secondary rings and then move to the tertiary rings, uh, any type of wind, uh, any type of water, like if your water systems are going to come up through there, any kind of contaminated water, septic, backup. And then, of course, uh, those that died but weren't in the initial blast ring, which was incinerated, uh, you're going to have the biological effects of those bodies decomposing and different things like that, which are going to cause more of a biological effect than the initial <clears throat> nuclear effect. Uh, happy news. Happy, very happy. happy, happy. Uh, I, sh I should mention um, that Bert has a PhD uh, in... Well, tell us about your training. Uh, so uh, the Navy originally took me under their wing and gave me a nuclear engineering training. And then uh, from there, I, developed, I got my bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering. I got my master's degree in engineering management, and then I got my doctorate in international relations, uh, specifically because I was working overseas with the Navy, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, actually training uh, our allies in their response to chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear attacks. Yeah, so events. talking about disaster preparedness, 
and what to do after a disaster. And I do want to talk about that here. Yes. But the Wallerstein, uh, it's a website that's what? It's, uh, it's built to, to advise the public. It's not private or it's not confidential. It's not classified in any way. No, it's uh, open source, released to anybody who wants to use a nuke map. Yeah. Uh, just Google nuke map and you can see it. You can put your own information in. Um, and it's not 100% um, it's precise. It does concentric circle uh, blast radius, so it doesn't take into effect it wouldn't be exact mountain circles, ranges yeah, yeah. or anything. The topography yes. would change. It wouldn't be an exact circle. Exactly. Circuit. Yeah, buildings will, um, Mountains, like you mentioned, yeah. Hiroshima. Um, buildings actually had imprints of a person standing in front of a, of a wall. You'd see the imprint of a person on the wall. So, any material in the path would then restrict the path mile. So it's not an exact concentric circle that comes out. It would be affected by buildings, mountains. It would also be affected by the wind, the air, anything at the time. So. You're talking about a person standing in front of a wall. What happens to that person? So in is it vaporized? Uh, they are vaporized. It's a stain on the wall. It's a, well, he's not a stain on the wall. What actually happened is the impact um, of the, think of it like light, like a sunburn, suntan, right? Um, it's a very crude way to talk about it, but um, back when I was a kid, girls used to take little stickers of bunnies and put them on their stomach when they'd go get a suntan. Then they'd take it off and the skin would be lighter underneath. Same type of concept. When the initial nuclear blast hit, the body blocked the rays just for a split second, so it discolored the wall just a little uh, bit differently. Okay. So you would see an exact silhouette of the person who was in front of the wall. And when the, the person in front of the wall would take would would, take the blast. And, and they were vaporized. The person in front of the wall vaporized. So all you see yeah. is the part that where they... The imprint, yeah. Where they yeah, the blocked. radioactive yeah. you know, didn't... Uh -huh. okay. yeah. So let's see the, the graph you were looking at from Wallerstein. Yeah, okay, so the first there. one... Um, oh, that's a... I believe that's the second one. The first one is the one that has a very small circle, and that's uh, first basically uh, this is what they estimate would happen with a 150 kiloton uh, North Korean. Okay. This is missile. the right one. Then. Yes, this is yes. the right one. So 100, 100, 100 150 kilotons. kiloton. So that's about 10 that's times. That's 10 times the size of Hiroshima. Hiroshima, yes. Okay, and, and, and the little pinpoint there—that's the center. That would be like Pearl Harbor. If they were if they were targeting Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. okay. then the pinpoint would be there at Pearl yeah. Harbor. And so they have an estimate of about 20,000 deaths and about 117,000 uh, um, people that would need assistance. Uh, okay, afterwards. so the people, now the people who, you know, I mean, this is, it's old news already, but I think when this happened, when this alarm happened, people mm -hmm. had that vision that they would be vaporized and, right. and they wouldn't, they wouldn't, yeah. you know, just. So if you, if you look at what happened, or the uh, blast from a North Korean missile, it wouldn't be as bad as what people were kind of envisioning, right? So there would be a lot of uh, additional. It's only meat. 150 kilos. Well, it's, that's small in comparison to some of the others that uh, we yeah. have graphics for. But uh, there, there would be a lot of assistance that's going to be needed. And how do we get to help those people that are the survivors? What do we do after the fact? Um, Bert has some very good information in, in terms of all the planning and, and what goes into uh, the response and how do you respond, what do you do to help those survivors? Now the ones at the center, um, you know, within, what the, I forget the uh, concentric right. diameter, but um, th they, would, they wouldn't know what hit them. They wouldn't know. They, they, it was just instant, like, right. instantaneous. Um, and the ones who survived would have to be how far away from the blast, given 150 kilotons, how far away would they be? Uh, looks, uh... So the first 450 meters is your fireball radius, your immediate devastation radius. Um, second is a 500, uh, the 500 rem is your one kilometers. So you're gonna get 500 rems at one kilometers, and then 3.7 kilometers is your air blast radius. And then your thermal radiation radius is gonna be about 5.26 kilometers. That's where you're gonna have your third degree burns in your, in your major issues. So anywhere outside of 3.7 to 5.3 uh, kilometers is where you're really gonna have uh, the major impact of severely wounded individuals. Uh, within that three kilometers, there's not gonna to be too many wounded individuals unless they were uh, perfectly behind uh, large Luckily. concrete blocks yeah, or yeah. something like that. Like the people who were in that building in Hiroshima, it was one, it was a library yes. building and it yes. was really thick right. walls and somehow they survived. All the other buildings were devastated, know, yeah. yeah. And then to remember too, one of the chief differences is, is this an aerial attack or a ground attack? And so if it's an, if, if it's an aerial explosion, 
uh, it's a major REM explosion. It's a major a radiation explosion. If it hits the ground and has a ground impact, that's when you see buildings fall down. That's where you see a massive uh, energy transfer into the ground, into the mass. Now, the concentric rings are much smaller, but the immediate devastation is much greater. If it's an aerial attack, you'll see a lot of the third degree burns um, melting, uh, and you'll see those types of issues more than you'll see. So these intercontinental ballistic missiles, you know, what are they? Are they aerial or ground? So ICBMs are a totally different thing altogether. So especially uh, Russian and Chinese and American ICBMs. So a single ICBM missile isn't just one missile. It'll be a series of, I mean, it's classified how many, but it's a series of missiles. And so when you see one ICBM take off, when it actually um, comes back down and, and enters into the atmosphere, it'll split into many hundreds of missiles hundreds. that will attack at one time. Hundreds so, of nuclear bombs. And, and they have both ground and aerial assault capacity. And some of them would be dummies, so you wouldn't know which one to target. So it's hard to stop Hard, them. Hard to stop it. Yes. Yeah. The only way to stop them is before they come back down. Correct. Yeah. Well, there's two major ways to stop them. One is uh, taking them out on their way up, and the second is to take out their uh, guidance systems. They let them go somewhere else. Yes. But when they come back down, some of the bombs in this ICBM are going to be programmed to blow up at, at, at altitude yes. over a given city. Yes. And others, no, others just go down and they, they're, what, they're set off by, by hitting the ground or they're set off when they hit the ground? There's several different ways that they're set off. Um, each it's country nice has their own. Been putting a lot of yeah. time into this. <laughs> each each country has their own method of which, they, which they use. But safe to say that some are set to hit, um, some are set to hit on ground, some are set to implant into the ground and detonate after, and some are set to detonate above ground. Oh, so they wouldn't all blow up at the same time. No, no. It's like the, in those terrorist uh, scenarios where you got a bomb that blows up. The crowd comes in to save those mm -hmm. people who were hurt in the original blast, yeah. and now a second one goes off yep. like yes. that. Mm -hmm. And then in those types of weapons, you also have to uh, consider the uh, EMPs that wipe out electronics, and so there's different uh, uh, there's different components of those type of weaponry. So an ICBM is a much more sophisticated, uh, very significant event for coming into, especially to an island like Hawaii. Um, where versus a, a single, like a, just missile. a bomb being dropped out of like the Enola Gay, as you mentioned, yeah. or um, a rogue uh, ship coming into a port and detonating, or someone being able to just lob one, um, one missile in from a submarine or something like that. Um, but actually being able to uh, fire a missile uh, from thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away, uh, have it reach orbit, have it re-enter, and not be burned up, and have it actually have uh, secondary, tertiary, and quadrary targeting capacity to be able to hit exactly where they're aiming, is a very sophisticated country's capacity and capability. Mm, mm, mm. So, um, do you, do you ever hear about nuclear bombs that are mixed with, um, you know, germ warfare bombs, or other kinds of weapons, I mean, or they only come pure, nuclear only? Well, one of the greatest things about a nuclear weapon is that uh, it does eradicate uh, any kind of biological. And so if you would have some sort of a biological weapon on board a nuclear weapon, the nuclear weapon itself would have eradicated the biological oh, weapon. okay. And so... There's no point in having them both then? Well, there's two reasons why there's no point in having them both. Um, number one is the nuclear weapon would eradicate it. Number two is the nuclear weapon detonating creates it. So with any kind of uh, human or organic matter that's around there that starts to decompose, uh, with the large scale of the bodies that would be decomposing, plus the fact that they're all radiated, so nobody can come in and take those bodies and dispose of them properly so they don't have biological issues, they would create their own biological issues. Yeah, sure. Okay, you give me a headache. Let's Sorry take a break. That, we'll yeah. take a short break. Uh, that's Bert Lord and uh, uh, Sidney Higa. We'll be right back talk about how you how you try to... Mm, save people afterward. Yeah. Yes.
Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're trying to cope with these possibilities. They are mind blowing. Um, this is a Major Sidney uh, Higa, retired major from the U.S. Air Force, and Bert Lord, retired nuclear engineer from the U.S. Navy. So, uh, one other chart we want to see is the the chart with the the big Russian bomb. Big it has Russian a much bomb. bigger footprint, um, and uh, this is this this would do much more damage. Um, and uh, if it's an ICBM. There would be more than one of them on board, yeah? Um, this one, the, the graphic you're seeing right here is actually um, our uh, mid-level bomb. Okay. And so in an ICBM, this type of bomb right here, it would probably, it would have uh, several dozen of this capacity. Uh -huh. And if you can show the next, um, yeah, the next this, larger. One with the, uh, that's it. And then this one, there would be two to four of these in an ICBM. And so it would actually... Any one of them would just really destroy the island. For yeah. Hawaii, yeah. It yeah. would be, it'd be a, very, a significant game changer for the uh, island of Oahu. So and it sort of depends on who, who shot the thing in the air. Yes, If, if exactly. the Koreans did it, it'd probably be one size and capability. If the, and, and if the North Koreans did it, yeah, it's probably a smaller. If yeah. the Russians did it, their standard is about an 800 kiloton. If the Chinese were to uh, shoot it, one at us, it's a five... Five megaton is our standard. Wow. So the biggest one is then from the... The Russians uh, tested one at 100 megatons. Okay. They're the biggest. That's huge. Nice yeah. to know. <clears throat> so you want to look at the markings as it's coming in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have devastation here. And a lot of people are burned to a crisp immediately, and a lot of others are, they're not going to last very long. Some others are going to be victims of the secondary effects. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, uh, I mean, who saves us? Who saves us and what do they do to save us? And is it worth being saved, honestly? Well, I, th I think that the, the large majority of the responders to help us here on Oahu would be coming from the outer islands. But then how do you set up the communications so that they can all... Transportation, too. Transportation. Uh, the communications, who's going to be responding, where will you take them to, uh, as Bert alluded to, you know, uh, with the dead bodies, how do you get rid of them, because that creates a, a hazard in, in itself. A biological hazard, a, yes. a disease risk. Yeah? Yes. Uh, but but as, you, as you mentioned earlier uh, before the show, is the problem is you've got to handle them, and they're, they're hot, they're radioactive, so the people who are handling them are, are at risk now. Yes, yeah, so if there was an attack on Oahu, um, what the uh, what the CRB uh, basically the chemical biological radiological response units what they is that military or civilian or what? So it's mostly military. There's um, the civilian aspects of this um, do come in out of the CDC, and there are a few uh, civilian capabilities that exist. Mostly, it's a military capability. Uh, and Does then, it exist right now today? Can yes. I have a certain amount of comfort from that? So the, the command is uh, located in Aberdeen, uh, Maryland, at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, and they have uh, response units that are forward deployed in many different locations to be able to quickly respond. Uh, in an event like this, though, it's not often about saving who's there. Uh, it's about finding a way to move on, move forward. So one of the major uh, impacts is wildlife, is the dead bodies, the biological effects, the fact that um, you don't have any electrical power at this point, so there is no septic, there's no septic, no septic systems, there's no water, there's no way to get fresh food in. And so... And, and the food that was there would probably be irradiated, no? Irradiated, yes. You do not want to eat the foods that are there. Um, a lot of things that are really sad is uh, this would become an evacuation event. Which means nobody can stay behind. And so, right, no one's going to stay behind. So what the military would do is they would... Um, start trying trying to find ways to communicate with people. They have aircraft that they use uh, broadcast systems with. They would broadcast on AM radio. They broadcast on as many uh, channels that they had available to them as possible. 
Uh, Sydney knows way more about that than I do. Yeah, but you know, you mentioned Sydney a minute ago about coming from the neighbor islands because the neighbor right. islands would have some some vitality left, right. uh, hopefully. So long as they but, weren't hit as well. well you know. How would they come? There's no ferry, Sydney. They'd have to <laughs> canoe it over, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> taking taking uh, yeah, Hawaiian Air is not going to help. <laughs> it's not going to help because the airport will probably be destroyed as well. Yeah. So that's that's something that we have to look at for the long term and, and start to make those plans. See how we can get the supplies flown over. Dillingham might have to be expanded to yeah, you know Dillingham Field. accept uh, larger aircraft yeah. and, and stuff. Because that's that's far from the particular far blast, from the, uh, blast center. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or perhaps we need to have some other docking so they can bring you know ships with uh, supplies and stuff in uh, maybe towards the Kaneohe side or or. Up towards Last the North time Shore. I looked, it took a ship, even a fast ship, even a nuclear carrier, it takes three, four days to get here from the from the, the West, West Coast, Coast, assuming right. it was ready to make the trip. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why we would have to be dependent upon our our local uh, neighbors on the outer islands. Yeah, that's what would have to be. But there's no way to to make the trip on water. Um, there, like, it's they not use very quick. Commercial, enough. you know, cargo ships. Uh -huh. I suppose get on a cargo ship, come over. Some barges. Yeah, it would be pandemonium, wouldn't it? Nobody it, would it, know what to do. It would be all heck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and then as you said, it's an evacuation zone. Yeah. It is. So the it trick becomes, is to get out of town in any way you can. It, yeah, it's it would become an evacuation event, and uh, there are several landing craft that can approach uh, LCAX, LAX, you know, that are able to actually approach on beaches and to do extraction points. But the military would come in and set up extraction points and they would pull off people as soon as they can, but they would set up um, decontamination centers that everyone would have to come in and go through a decontamination center, and you would be, uh, basically there would be triage at that point where um, even though you're walking, you're beyond uh, being able to save. Um, these individuals we can bring in, but they're contaminated, so they have to go to a slow decontamination center. These individuals are out of the blast range, can come in, um, and it would only be humans. You'd have to leave all your pets behind because you can't ask your pet how close to the blast radius they were. So you have no idea how irradiated they are. Uh, people don't normally have uh, Geiger counters in their house, so they can't really tell the contamination levels. Uh, but it's very really important to, uh, after the blast, go in, shower, get whatever fresh water you so have. Assuming there was any water pressure. Any, any so any any anytime, water left. well, water pressure, but anytime that you hear, like if we ever get that warning, the most important thing to do, Save fill water. up your bathtubs with water. Yeah, just, just fill up your bathroom, sinks, everything with as much water as possible. Yeah. Um, get people inside. If someone comes in from outside, um, comb their hair, get everything out of their hair, wash them with water, tepid water, not hot, not cold, because you don't want to change your cellular structure to grasp or to sweat. Yeah. And you just want to wash as much off as possible. Get to a safe place. There's actually a three-day wait out. We call it a three-day wait out. So if someone wants to prep for this, having three days of food that they can prepare without cooking it or something like that available in their house, but there's a three-day wait out. After three days after a nuclear blast, the contamination will half-life will have gone down such that you can walk around a little bit outside. But, so, you're, but when you're dangerous, it's not only that you're dangerous to yourself, you're dangerous to those around you, right? Exactly, yes. yes. And so that's why we wanted to wash off, not for just them, but for anybody in their family. Anybody around, around them as well, yeah, and mm -hmm. no pets. Make all your pets stay outside. And leave, and don't pet your don't pet. Don't bring them in. Don't because pet them. Because your pet don't might be more them. radioactive than you yeah. are. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And uh, any kind of, and also people think like, well, I could just live off the land. Well, you don't want to shoot a wild pig. You don't want to eat anything that it's, uh, it's could potentially be contaminated because yeah. then you're going to internally contaminate yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's hard, you know, because a lot of people will die. Yes. From one, and, they, and, and it'll take a while sometimes, yeah. That, that's where yes. the preparedness comes in letting people know now so that they can be prepared and avoid the things that will cause them harm in the future. Yeah. So, I mean, assuming you're alive and assuming you haven't ruined yourself with contaminated material, um, what do you do? Because the city, the state, the, the island anyway, the island is, is really destroyed. It's not coming back till some you know, further time, maybe hundreds of years away. It's finished, which means no power, no water, as you said, no, no, no sewage. Um, no food, you can't uh, till the soil, you can't uh, touch an animal, um, all you can do is leave, right? And so if you had a little box with food for three days, what have you, where would you go, Sydney? 
would you head down to the harbor and hope one of those landing craft would pick you up? Uh, and who would you who would you be listening for? Who would be coming to help you? Would it be the Navy? Would it be the you know the National Guard? Would it be the HPD? Who are you going to? Who has got open arms for you? Who will help you? That's where all the planning comes in. <clears throat> this is why we want to bring the attention out there so that we can inform the people to get ready so that the other departments can be prepared to respond to this type of a catastrophe. Yeah, so it's all about communication. Communication. This is your area. That's my area, yes. So what, what's the optimal way to handle the communication end of it? Somebody has to be in charge. Somebody would have to be in charge. And, and, give the, you know, and, and then when we had the false alarm a few weeks ago, there was really nobody. You know, my wife called HPD and they said, find shelter. Mm -hmm. And she said, what? Is that it? That's all you got? Uh, <laughs> so HPD yeah. didn't know anything about yeah. this. Well, so who would you call? Well, in, in a case like that, you would have to have, you would want to have communications equipment that if you were to be destroyed by an EMP, it would be in a shelter so that you could bring out the communications and start setting it up for the first responders so that they can communicate. Once they're communicating, now you have them go out to the different communities and, and have them assist people. But they would be the primary core of communications. This is like the Titanic, you know. Uh, uh, they're not gonna feel safe either. They're going out into a highly irradiated area. Right. Yeah. They're dealing with highly irradiated people. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd have to wear clothes and, and they would be at risk in their lives, wouldn't they? How do you get people? How much do you pay those people? How do you get those people to commit to do right. that? Who are they? Those are, those are the people that, that have the heart to help other people. Those are the ones that are going to be those responders. Are they existing law enforcement or are they recruited after the fact to help? I think uh, there's some organizations like emergency management uh, professionals, I believe it is, that they have a lot of volunteers, and so that'd be a good start, is for people to get involved with that organization and volunteer their services. So again, go back to my question, do I, do I make down for the harbor, feeling that that's the only way help is gonna get to me? Do I walk down there, walk down you know, the, the highway, try to get to the harbor, find um, the military, maybe a ship, maybe the Navy, uh, maybe a carrier that would take a lot of people out? Um, is there anybody coming for me at the harbor? I mean, where do I go? Where would, where would the first responders tell me to go? That's, that's the key issue that's here key, on the, yeah. the state of Hawaii. Uh, that has not been instituted. So the reality of your question is everybody's question. And the answer doesn't exist at this point. So um, the answer has to be formulated, it has to be prepared for, and then it has to be dispersed to the public. Yeah. And at this point, it hasn't been done. And that's uh, the United States government and the State Department and Defense Department, actually, and Department of Energy spend lots of money teaching other countries how to do this. But we do very little of it actually inside our own country. We saw that in Puerto Rico. We did see that in Puerto yes, Rico, yes. Absolutely. So, where, where the federal government was like uh, AWOL in Puerto Rico. <laughs> well, one of the things about Puerto Rico is the federal government actually did show up. But there was, but Puerto Rico themselves had nothing in place to take government aid, federal government aid, and disperse it anywhere. Uh, actually, it, we would be exactly like Puerto Rico. The federal government would respond uh, with ships, three-day ships. That's why three days is a good window to work with anyways, because you mentioned as soon as the attack happens, what should you do? Well, the reality of it is you should stay in place for at least three days. It is stay terrible. Indoors. Stay indoors. Stay indoors inside your house. Close your windows. Hopefully close your you drapes. have a little food and water. Hopefully you have a little food and water. I mean, if you have to go out and find food and water, obviously, but... If you have the ability to stay inside, stay in place for at least three days. What should happen is uh, military and civil defense, uh, which I don't believe we really have here, at least I've never heard of them. If they exist, I apologize, but I have not heard of them. And the civil defense is who is supposed to get the message out of what to do, where to meet. You know, and they are the ones that are supposed to coordinate the military, federal government, local government, HPD, uh, HFD. Mm. They're supposed to coordinate that response. Mm. Um, the civil defense people that everyone knows about right now is the guy who hit the trigger and put right. out the false message. Not a lot message. of confidence there. Right, exactly, I mean, yes. Going to a step further, you know, civil defense to me was in the 50s. That's when the whole civil defense thing was designed. Duck, it cover, was against get under Russian desk, missiles yeah. back when, which, you know, that went away. And, mm -hmm. right. and I think civil defense in large part went away. And in any event, civil defense went away in the minds of the population. It went away like mm -hmm. it doesn't exist. So, I mean, we're about out of time. 
Sydney. So yes. could you could you tell us what mindset we should have? This is uh, this is really. Uh, very right. valuable news, yeah. so, but it may be a, a fatal situation where you have to make peace with your maker than, rather than anything else. Um, so what, what do we think of? What do we do? How do we, how do we walk around the street this afternoon and tomorrow thinking about this possibility? Is it a matter of just saying, well, okay, you know, uh, it will be what it will be, or do we have a plan in our minds, a mental, a mental attitude that we should have? Well, first off, uh, the Hawaii State Department of Defense with their Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. They do have some valuable information on the website. Um, there's a, the Emergency Management Professionals of Hawaii. They have a website. They have inf good information there. There are some organizations. I have a friend, his name is uh, Gus Lakion, and he runs 9-11 seminars. So he'll do community training for you know what to do and, and uh, how to be prepared in, in terms of uh, different uh, natural events such as tsunami, earthquake, even a, a nuclear uh, attack. So I would uh, start planning myself to get educated so that I could teach my family, my friends, my neighbors, because um, uh, it really ev everything really starts with yourself. You don't want to be depending on an agency for everything because they can't do everything. You're right, government, yeah. and you know, government these days is. People don't have a lot of confidence in government. That's the reality. I have one last question for you guys. I'd be very interested in your answer. This is the last question we have to close after yes, this. Sir. But this is not an easy question. It's a hard question. Okay? There will be no law and order here for a lot of people. So I have my little care package. I have food. I have water, whatever, to live. Is there a gun in my package? Probably. I mean, if you want to keep it. <laughs> if you want to keep your package. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Sydney, great discussion. Thank you so thank you much. Thank you very much. Bert, Lord, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having oh, us on the show. Guys, be safe. Thank you very much.